shattered. 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 Too unbreakable. Listen here, sweet sister. Whether you think you have one little crack or you are shattered into a billion pieces, this podcast is going to give you the resources, tools, and skills to help piece yourself back together to form a beautiful, unique, solid, and unbreakable masterpiece. You are listening to Shattered to Unbreakable, the Reclaim Podcast. Let's talk. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Shattered to Unbreakable. I am your host, as always, Brandy Babin, and I have special guest Stephanie Larson with me today. She is a friggin' B.A., if you know what that means. (laughs) Uh, Stephanie, thanks for coming on. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. I was doing a little put out feelers for some people with amazing stories and Steph was like, I'll do it. And I was like, heck yeah, you will. Like (laughs) you have a great story. Um, (laughs) And you're definitely one of the people that I would think of to be on the podcast. So I just didn't know what you would like to share and what you wouldn't. So you do have some things to share with us today that you're so bravely coming on and saying, hey, this was my fall and this is how I got through it. So as you guys know, season four, Our theme is the fall, where we fall in life and how we get through it, stand back up and keep walking. So Steph, without further ado, would you tell (laughs) us a little bit about you and how you came to this fall that you'll be telling us about? Yes. So it all started, I would say, just growing up. I didn't have like the greatest home life. My mom was into drugs and drinking and um, she's a single mom. So, you know, she was doing her best with what she had, but Growing up, just wasn't a lot of support. Um, Me and my sister started drinking really young. I started doing drugs. First person I did drugs with was my mom. She introduced me to all of that. And just she had boyfriends and just kind of saw her sleeping around. And then she married this guy who wasn't great. He beat me up. He beat her up and just kind of started this pattern of, you know, what I thought reality was and what life was like and then really just never had a connection with her i thought doing all of the things that she did would help us get closer because we didn't have a great relationship and it turns out Mm. that didn't work that didn't work it just grew us further apart but um by the time i was 15 i got pregnant and um actually miscarried the baby and Mm. um you know there's a whole nother story there that I could tell sometime, but, um, God, you know, she kept me with her the whole time. Like I still get to see her sometimes I've seen her grown up in, in my dreams. Um, that's another story growing up. We moved around a lot too. And, um, I would say it all really kind of fell apart in Arizona Mm -hmm. when we lived in Arizona. Um, the guy that she was with, just he was an awful guy and that's really where the drug addiction I would say solidified in my life I suppose um was really hitting bottom never really like I didn't have a lot of friends I didn't have that acceptance piece from my mom and then we moved back to Colorado and just got in with the wrong crowd I didn't finish high school was in and out of my house um since I was 14 when we came back to Colorado, um, I ended up with this guy who was very abusive through high school. Um, I got kicked out of high school because of my attendance, because he wouldn't let me leave the house. Oh, um, just got really heavy into drugs to kind of cope with it all and deal with it all. And he, he broke my jaw. He nearly killed me three times. And leaving the night that I left there was probably my first encounter with the Lord. I don't know how I walked out of there um, alive, but somehow I kept walking out. From there, I went back home with my mom, started doing meth with her, you know, really, really headed down the rabbit hole, I would say. I lost myself um, there. Let's see got arrested. I make a joke about how I didn't start committing crimes until I was an adult. (laughs) Um, But when I was 18, that's when I started getting arrested. The cool thing about it was every time I went to jail, 
the first person to ever talk to me would always tell me, you know, God loves you and Jesus loves you. And, you know, it was always something like that. It was never like, why are you here? What did you do? Like, it was always, God loves you. That's where you had to go to get the guidance. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, It really, like, I got arrested. I got arrested eight times. I was in and out quite a bit. Um, I would say that through the year from the time I was 18 until the time um, I was like 19, from 18 to 19, um, that was the worst. So I was in and out of jail. I somehow, I ended up with this guy who sold me actually um, to a brothel in Denver for $1,300 and a bag of dope. That's when I learned what my value was. It was rough, like really rough. I got down to like 98 pounds. I somehow have all of my teeth. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Which is great. <laughs> but I got out. I was in, I, I'm i not really even sure how I got out. Like it was just a miracle of how I got rescued out of that Um, place in Denver. The guy actually that sold me there came to pick me up to take me on a date. He brought, bought a date with me and forgot to take me back. And so I escaped from his house. So I guess I do know how it happened, but it's just a miracle. That's crazy, man. Crazy. Lots of, lots of drugs there. That was the most awful place. All of these stories can be many stories. I was going to say like, okay, episode for each of these stories, like each arrest, each each chapter, Um, it could be a whole episode. It could be, yeah, it's a long story. But to sum it up, you know, the last time I got arrested, so each time I was in jail, the first person that would always, like I said, come up would always introduce me to God. You know, it was always God first. Jesus loves you. I don't know. Like I got sprinkled in jail, even though I didn't really know what that meant and brought a Bible home with me a couple of times. But every time I would get out, I would just forget who God was and what that meant. And the last time that I was in jail, it was when I really gave my life to the Lord. And he, it was crazy because six months there, I started having seizures. If I had five grand mal seizures in six months, um, wow. I, you know, it's probably a combination of the drugs and, you know, head injuries from getting beat up. I've had several concussions. So it's probably a combination of the two things, but I had, so the night that I gave my life to the Lord, I was in jail. I, I was having this dream and I don't, I don't remember having a seizure, but I had a seizure in my sleep, a grandma seizure in my sleep. And, um, in the dream, all I remember was, so I, like I had said in the beginning, like I would have dreams of my daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was having this dream of her. I was standing, standing there in this room, watching myself sit down at a table with her. Um, she was about six, six years old in the dream. And every time I'd have a dream of her, I never saw her face. This time I saw her face. She was coloring and she had pigtails in her hair and she turned around and she looked at the me standing there watching me and her sitting together. And when she turned and looked at me, um, the me sitting next to her fell down on the floor and started having a seizure. Oh, wow. And when the So then the dream flipped and I started having flashbacks of getting beaten up and then it would switch back to me having a seizure and then it would switch back to me getting beat up and that happened a few times. And then the last time it switched to getting beaten up, everything just went completely black. And there was this darkness that I don't really know how to describe. It was like, I felt like I was falling and it was just this this blackness and I could hear screaming and I felt like I was falling and I just, I I wanted to open my eyes, but I couldn't open my eyes. And then there was just like this, this flash, this light, this, it was like bright, super bright. And then I woke up and there was all these paramedics and people around me because I had been pronounced dead and um, told me that I had had a seizure and everything. And, um, that, that was when I gave my life to the Lord and 
Um, I was 19 at the time. I'm 39 now, and I have been clean and free from drugs since that moment. Um, and it's all to the Lord. There's no way that I could overcome a meth addiction and, yeah. you know, all of those things without Jesus. And I prayed like while I was in jail, um, you know, that I, I wouldn't, I didn't want to go back out and be around that, all those same people just because it terrified me. Like I knew somebody on every street corner, you know, that right. either sold drugs, did drugs, made drugs. Like, right. <laughs> like it, that was the lifestyle. That's what I grew up in. And I didn't want to go back to that. And so I actually got to stay in jail longer. It was like an answer to prayer. I got a warrant out for my arrest while I was in jail. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't Talk get to leave. Prayers. <laughs> and um, the funny thing about all of it is like through the whole process, they would always release me to my mom, which there was a court ordered restraining order put between me and my mom because she was also the first person I got arrested with. <laughs> so, but yeah, it, so they released me to my mom. My mom moved to Northern Colorado while in that whole interim where I got to stay in jail. And so mm. I moved to Loveland, Colorado, when I got released from jail, that whole thing got dismissed. And um, I I mean, that's, that's pretty much my story. There's a lot more that I can say. But yeah, I moved to Loveland and continued with the Lord. And I'm just so thankful every day that I get to, yeah. to be here. I, I didn't think I'd make it past 19. And I, um, I got my GED in 2017. Nice. So I finally finished school and, um, yeah, I have a son now and he's 14 and that's crazy. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Life is, life is messy, but <laughs> life is, is messy. Good. That's right. <laughs> well, is I think good. And something that stuck out to me that you said, was I didn't want to go back and be around those same people. And I think when people are overcoming addiction and changing their life, you do have to say goodbye yeah. to like your whole circle, you know, like yeah, there's, there's no way to go back to that. You have to create a whole new circle and that is really scary. What would you say is like a good tip for people who have to literally rebuild their entire circle, including their family? to get away from the toxic relationships, you have to completely remove yourself. I mean, even though I got released to my mom, I ended up moving in with another family when I came to Northern Colorado because I just, I still couldn't like move on. She, I was trying my hardest to be right. good and do all of the right things and pursue the Lord, but she hadn't changed. And so right. it was really important for me to find a completely different group of a completely different life. I had to, I had to completely separate myself. Yeah. And I will say that like, you know, to be fair to my mom, like I love her and we're working on it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like you said, she was doing the best of what she had. And that's just like the hard truth of it sometimes. Like yeah, when you don't know any better, you can't do any better until you're yeah, shown bro. something different we're all responsible for what we know. So exactly, exactly. She didn't know any better. Right. So um, yeah, I would say, yeah, getting away from everything. And right. I mean, even like with family, I mean, that's a hard one because you love your yeah. family. Yeah. But I think while you're healing and you're trying to change, you've got to just get away. Seriously. What, like, how did you meet new people that were healthier for you? Was it at church mostly or yeah, did you so know of some people? The people who lived next door to where I was when I first got out of jail and came to Northern Colorado, they went to a church here in town and they invited me to come with them. And I, that was my first experience with church. And I, I asked, you know, I asked the girl, the lady who took me, um, if she knew anybody my age. And so then she introduced me to people my age and then just nice. kind of all stemmed from there. So yeah. finally found a good group. To yeah. And we met at a mom's group at church. Yeah. So yeah, yeah you've met some really great people. Not that, it's not that I'm great by you any means. You are pretty great. But we are great together. And so life now is incredible because like you said, there are some messy pieces and you're still healing from a lot. And there's a whole lot of courage that you've carried through to a lot of the circumstances you fought through since I've known you. But as far as 
if you guys could see Stephanie, I might even post a picture of you. She's, I mean, muscular and healthy <laughs> and beautiful and strong. And you're an amazing artist. Like if any of you have seen the body paint pictures of me where I'm like rustic, um, teals and coppers, <laughs> Stephanie did all that makeup. And then the ones with me totally white with the gold cracks, Stephanie did all that makeup. So the only thing I'm responsible for is doing her hair for the warrior shoot that we did. Yes, it was so fun too. <laughs> yeah, so you're a very accomplished makeup artist. So if anybody needs makeup, she's your girl. <laughs> and then you're just very artistic. You're super artistic and very in shape. You worked at Spanga for a while and mm -hmm. were everybody, you were everybody's uh, favorite cycle instructor mm -hmm. I talked to. Anytime I would meet somebody that went to Spanga, they're like, I was like, do you know Stephanie? Like, oh my gosh, yes, we love Stephanie. <laughs> so yeah, you're an inspiration to so many people. And uh, so as far as like, I don't know, I feel like I don't have a lot of background in coming back from something hardcore, you know, like I haven't been to jail. I've been addicted to little things like shopping or, <laughs> you know, yeah. something like that. I think everybody needs that, like, come to Jesus rock bottom moment where you're like, if I don't change something, I'm going to die. So is there anything else other than getting away from toxicity? Like, what else did you do to foster that healing process throughout the years? Um, I mean, really, I dove hard into Jesus. I think that was really my anchor just really finding something to to focus on and hold on to because I didn't I didn't have I was kind of an aimless ship for most of my life and I really I really believe that like having that that solid you know because Jesus is a person it's not he's not just an idea like he's a person right. and you know getting into the Bible and just I think that really, that really helped kind of rewire my brain and my yeah. thinking, and my heart and, you know, gave me hope for something better because I definitely right. had never experienced anything joyful before, you know, um, before Jesus. So dang, that's heavy. So I think, I mean, Jesus, I mean, I don't know. Like I can't what was appealing that. about that to you? Or was it just like indescribable? Like what was appealing about Jesus and faith after that? After, I mean, so every time I would go to jail, like I would start reading. I mean, there's lots of experiences. Like I said, I could tell you <laughs> um, one, one crazy one that was, I can, I'll tell you real quick. When I was in jail, it was like, God was just, God just showed up. Like he was, he is in jail. Like there is, he is so present there. And there are so many believers in jail. Yeah. It's crazy. But there was this one time, there was this other girl that I had started actually a Bible study with while I was in jail. And there, we were just sitting at this table, um, there in the common area and minimum, in minimum security, there's like a lot of freedom, you know, like there's just yeah. tables and you're just kind of out walking around. Um, but there was this girl, she was sitting at the table kind of next to us and there was a Bible sitting on the table and we were just sitting there. And I remember just like staring at her and she started having a seizure and I had had seizures, but I'd never seen a seizure. Yeah. And so I was like, oh my gosh, like, what do we do? And we just started praying for her. Mm -hmm. And as we were praying, she like her, her, she was like shaking and she kept like reaching for the Bible and um, the Bible was moving away from her. Like she wasn't even touching it, but Whoa. the Bible was just like moving away from her. And then she like, she went into a full like thing and she went like this and she turned purple and started foaming at the mouth and she fell and, you know, all these people were you know, gathering, like everybody like rushed over and like the, you know, the, the deputies ran over and the paramedics ran over and like, we were praying just the whole time we were praying. And, um, it was crazy because the girl that I was with, she was praying that, you know, certain groups of people would move away. You know, she's like, yeah. these people, I, you know, God moved them away. And then just a group of people would move away Whoa. like as she like say it. And then another group of people until it finally was just like us and like maybe three or four other people. And then the, the you know, the medics and she was fine. Like she turned, like she survived and she is doing great, but it was just crazy. Like God yeah. just 
proving himself and time after time after time, just these miraculous things would happen in jail and just tons and tons of spiritual warfare. And it, I don't know, like he was just, there was just something so exciting about it, you know, that right. it was alive. It wasn't just something that I was reading about in this book. Like it was actually making a difference in my life. And like, I could feel him. I could, I could feel like his tangible. touch. I could feel his presence. I could see him doing things. And yeah. Um, it was just, it's exciting, you know, well, there you <laughs> have it guys. God is in jail. If you're looking for him, that's where he's at. I would, don't go there obviously, <laughs> if you can help it. But if you go, he's there. <laughs> oh um, my gosh. Well, it makes me think of like when Jesus said like healthy people don't need a doctor. I'm here for the sick. Yeah. You know, he right. was, he's not here for the righteous. He's here for the, the ones who don't know yet or haven't experienced him yet. Yeah, I think that's really beautiful. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing all of that. And um, yeah, we might have to have just like a Stephanie Larson season. <laughs> yeah, I can share all the my memoirs stories. of Steph. I have so <laughs> so many stories. Oh my gosh. Well, if any of you listening resonated with Stephanie and you want to learn more about her stories or just follow her on social media, um, she's going to tell you how to get a hold of her. But She's definitely someone you want to know. Um, you post things that are inspirational all the time, so she's worth the follow. But tell them how they can get a hold of you the easiest way. Probably Instagram. I'm on Instagram and Facebook. Um, if you just look, um, it's live underscore strong 2123 um, is my Instagram handle, live strong. And then, or you could just search my name, Stephanie Larson. Yes. Um, Perfect. Yeah. Well, I am blessed to know you and I'm so glad that you decided to come on and tell everybody because yeah. I think addiction isn't people who suffer from addiction suffer lonely. Yeah. Um, it's just a lonely, you don't want to admit it and you don't yeah. want to say you have a problem really. And then, you know, sometimes it comes to these big monumental moments where you have yeah. to make the choice. Yeah. You're either losing someone or losing yourself or, you know, so it's hard. Yeah, it's so hard. It but I think, you know, the number one thing, I love that you got through this with no rehab. Like, that's amazing that this yeah. was enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think he, and he can be, it just, it takes letting him in, like truly yeah. letting him in all the way to right. take it. Because he says that he wants to do that, you know, like he wants to carry our burdens. He wants to fill the empty places in our hearts. And if you let him, he will. And yeah, exactly. I mean, through the whole thing, I mean, one of the things that I felt like God told me was that, you know, that all of those things, the addiction, the, the depression, the, you know, all of the, all of the things were all just a symptom. It's mm -hmm. just a symptom. They're symptoms of a bigger problem. And that's so uh, true. The problem was that I was broken and that I needed mm -hmm. to be filled up and I was searching for something to heal me and love me and affirm me and want me and know me. Oh, that's and good. I didn't, I didn't have that growing up. I never had that affirmation. And, you know, when I, I, Jesus filled it, he filled the holes, he filled the heart and, and then it all went away. Like it went better. <laughs> oh, that's so good. I mean, better. that's so important that you said that, like, cause every human we, we were born and created to be connected in relationship. And uh, if you don't have healthy relationships modeled for you in life, then you are searching to be connected and cherished and accepted and loved and wooed and, you know, lured away. Like he says, you know, I'll lure you away and make you my bride. He was talking about Israel, but he's talking about us too. And I just love the idea of being, you know, wooed by God's love. So I think that's definitely something to look forward to if you're wondering, should I go deeper with Jesus or God? Like this fulfillment and connection is unlike any other. I could definitely agree to that. And it's yeah. not really, you know, no other human can fulfill it. And what's cool about right. finding Jesus to fill that is you're not going to be looking for somebody else to do it. You're going to be completely okay on your own. Yeah. So yeah. anywho. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, <laughs> all of you listening, obviously stay sparkly and we will see you next week. Thanks again, Steph. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me, Brandy. All right. Bye everybody. Bye. 
Thanks for hanging out with us today. I just wanted to remind you about the resources we have on the reclaimstrategy.com. That is Reclaim University with free downloads. It's the Reclaim Guidebook, access to Kintsugi classes and events. So go ahead and take a look. Also, please share this podcast with anybody that you think might need to hear these messages. And if you haven't already and you think we deserve it, give us a five-star rating. That just helps our reach. So I love you guys. Stay sparkly and we will see you next week.